I wonder what you would put down as a life-changing moment. Maybe there's one time that was pivotal, a pivotal moment that changed the course of your life. Or perhaps you could join the dots over gradual things that have brought around about a gradual change for you. Living life well is more than just a catchy hashtag or a like on a Facebook post. But rather than change being thrust upon us, what if we could be the agents of change? Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to explore your word and to uh, understand a little bit more about what it is that um, I believe you're wanting to say to us today, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move amongst us wherever you have placed us today, that uh, you would help us to be able to have uh, hearts that would be open and, and uh, receptive to what it is that you want to say to us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are not just at work or were not just at work historically in the, the lives of the first followers of Jesus, but, but that you are at work in our lives today. And I ask that you would continue to do that good work in us even now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, today we continue our series of following Jesus as we look at following Jesus and the way it can change people's lives. And if you have your Bible with you, then I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. As we pick up from where we left off last week, uh, where we saw how Peter and the other disciples were empowered by the Holy Spirit and how it changed the life of Peter and how they were able to speak in amazing languages um, to the audience around them. And here in this account of people following Jesus and his call to make disciples, we see an amazing change for Peter and the other followers. As we noted last week, uh, these people a month earlier were concerned about saving their own skin. Peter would deny any association with Jesus and the followers of Jesus were hiding out behind locked doors, playing it safe. But now, wow, what a, what a difference a month has made. What a difference the coming of the Holy Spirit on their lives has made. Because they're suddenly serious about being followers of Jesus and the call that Jesus makes on their life. Rather than hiding out behind closed doors, they step out into uh, the open and step up to the call of Jesus on their lives. I invite you to follow as I read through from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to uh, verse 41. And it's a decent chunk of scripture. And there's some important things uh, for us today that I believe God wants us to consider as we continue to live life well as followers of Jesus. So this is Acts chapter 2, verse, starting at verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No. What you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon, like what we saw recently, will be turned blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, 
wonders and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen as his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. But death could not keep him in its grips. King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he was died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised, uh, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised from the dead, uh, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honour in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had he had promised gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today for David himself never ascended into heaven yet he said the Lord said to my Lord sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies making them footstools to you under your feet so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued to preach for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptised and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. And as I reflected on this account of people following Jesus, I was struck by the number of timeless principles for us today as we also follow Jesus and long to see God change lives. The first thing that stuck out for me was that following Jesus means taking Jesus' call seriously. For Peter and the other followers of Jesus, they took the call of, uh, that Jesus left with them to make disciples and, uh, was one that they took seriously. They didn't think it was someone else's responsibility that, well, someone else will do it, someone more gifted than me. Please don't assume that they always got it right and we'll discover a little bit about that in a fortnight's time. But the commissioning that Jesus gave in Matthew 28 and in Acts 1 to engage with others who don't know about Jesus personally and to help them to discover more about Jesus as Saviour and Lord was taken seriously, and they accepted responsibility for sharing the good news of Jesus. For us today, for the church today, and for us as followers of Jesus, each one of us has a personal responsibility to take the call of Jesus seriously. Matthew 28 and Acts 1 is not just a call for the first followers of Jesus. It's our call as well. We are the beneficiaries of others who took that call seriously and talked with us about Jesus 
and what it means to be a follower of Jesus and how it's changed our lives. So too, we are called by Jesus to those around us to help them to know and to experience the good news of Jesus as Saviour and Lord. It's intrinsically linked with what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to accept this call. Following Jesus also means caring about others. The disciples, they, they looked over the crowd of people and, and they cared about them. But not only them, but their families as well that they re represented. In verse 39, Peter speaks about the promise of a restored relationship with Creator God through being um, that is not only for them, but also for their families. Peter cared about the, the message of Jesus, but he also cared about those that were before him. In my experience, you don't strongly urge someone unless you care about them. And here we see Peter strongly urging people to respond to the message of Jesus because he cared about them. And I have no doubt that there's people that you care about as well. People that you care about that have a broken relationship with Creator God and that, that you would love to see that change for them. And while there are various ways to talk with others about Jesus, I really warm to Peter's starting point that he does here. You see, for Peter, following Jesus means that the conversation starts with the audience, with them, rather than with him. Notice where Peter starts engaging with those around him. Some of them were speaking in foreign languages and, and they, they, they thought that the followers of Jesus were, were, were drunk. Some of them even presented and, and they had questions or wanted to have a bit of a dig in and have a crack at the disciples. Peter and the other disciples were living life differently and it raised questions. Even if it was at an element, it had an element of ridicule about it. And, and so Peter looks to answer the questions that they were raising rather than starting at a different point. In verse 13, he says, but others in the crowd, uh, it says that, but others in the crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk. That's all. Peter starts with this question and the question that were raised gives um, response to and an opportunity for an answer. One of the failings when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus with others today is that we can often find ourselves trying to answer questions that people just aren't asking. We, we assume that they're asking the question of where will I spend eternity or how do I deal with this burden of sin? But the reality is many people just aren't asking those questions. Um, for the leadership group and for, for the ministry team, for Samantha, Alicia and I, we believe the first questions that the world around us are asking is not what must I do to be saved, but in the majority anyway. But we do hope and pray that at some point, people will come to the, the time of asking those questions. The questions that I'm not sure about you, but what I experience people are more asking the answers to is how do I get through this, whatever the this is? How do I deal with this pressure that I'm experiencing? How do I stop my marriage from falling apart or even is this a relationship that I want to continue in? Is it worth saving? How do I get through whatever that might be? And what will the future be for my kids? For the ministry team and for the leadership group, we believe that there's hope that we carry that can help link in with others and the questions that they carry. We believe that working with people as they understand and construct language around and seek to that we seek to answer some of these questions, that we can tap into the yearnings in people's lives as they seek to live life well. They'll do all sorts of things to try and live life well. They'll 
go through a change of diet, change of jobs, change of geography, they'll move, joining a fitness class and exploring elements of spirituality. While unfortunately we recognise that others will choose to answer some of the questions that they have in their life in more destructive ways by turning to self-medication to suppress the pain of a life that just isn't being lived well. Alcohol and other drugs, destructive relationships, or pinning their hopes on the next win with gamble agencies, gambling agencies exploiting and commercial media uh, frequently supporting that through paid advertising. We believe that a personal relationship with Jesus is key to truly living life well. But what questions are those around you asking? When you engage in conversations with them, what are the questions that they're asking that you believe that following Jesus can help create an answer for? Peter and the disciples were prepared to be um, quiet for long enough to listen to the questions being asked, and that's where they started. Not giving an answer to a question that no one was asking. Following Jesus also means responding in culturally relevant ways. Why were all these people there in Acts 2 in Jerusalem? Why were they there in Jerusalem to begin with? They'd travelled for thousands of kilometres to be in Jerusalem to worship Yahweh God. Jews and converts to Judaism. They knew that being in Jerusalem was essential. It was an important aspect of the traditions of what it meant to, to follow the God of the Old Testament. And, and so they were there for that reason. And, and they knew about David and the prophet Joel. So the language that Peter uses is culturally relevant to Peter's audience. As we heard Leah read a little bit earlier from Acts chapter 17, where Paul also adopts a similar position um, and, and takes on the same principles that we see at work in Acts chapter 2, as he shares the good news of Jesus to those in Athens. He sees the question based uh, around an altar where there's an altar that is set apart to an unknown God. Whether it had been lost in time, uh, the name inscribed on the, 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 the plinth, whether it was just made there with um, just in the hope that they wanted to cover all their bases, we're not quite sure. But Paul quotes from them and the language that they use about having this altar to an unknown God. But he also quotes from their philosophers and their poets that were used in that era as well. Paul listened to the heartbeat of the culture, the narrative that was woven within the culture. Paul then sought to help people to connect with the story of salvation and the good news of Jesus, starting at the point of where they were at and within their culture. As we continue to follow Jesus, and as we seek to see lives change, we need to adapt how we communicate the same message of the good news of Jesus. We need to be the hands and feet of Jesus, absolutely. But if that's all we are, then we've missed the point. We need to be the eyes of Jesus. We need to be the ears of Jesus. We need to be his voice as well. We need to understand our culture by engaging in it, not running from it. We need to ask questions and we need to listen and look to the answers and the story or the narrative that's, that's going on behind the answers that they give. What's the story behind their response? Prayerfully listen to the heart of the person. Be open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit that equips and empowers, empowers you today. Highlight and draw attention to, to where you suspect God might be at work in the person's life. 
remember that the Holy Spirit was there in that conversation first. The Holy Spirit was, was there with that person first before you even got there. Paul in Acts 17 and Peter in Acts 2 did this. The Holy Spirit was also at work in them, just as he is in you. Following Jesus also means being open to a variety of responses as well. For Peter, there was a, a, a question in verse 37, what should we do to be saved? What, how do we respond to this message, Peter, that you're giving us? And around 3,000 people responded and their lives were changed as a result. For Paul in Acts 17, some laughed it off while others wanted to know more and some became believers and their lives were changed as well. For us today, we can assume that we will get a negative response. We can almost have our language and our posture tense up, ready for a negative rather than prayerfully looking for the positive. We can even fear at times what do, what do we do if they say yes? What if they, what if they say, well, what should I do as a result of what you're talking to me about? But the best thing that we can do is to invite them to explore more with you and with others what it means to follow Jesus and to experience him as Saviour and Lord. We need to be prepared as a church to change what we do and how we do things as people respond to the good news of Jesus. Can you imagine the, the head spin for, for those first followers of Jesus, those disciples, as they go from a group of believers of about 120 people to suddenly 3,000 people being added in a day? That's a growing group of believers. And yes, absolutely, the majority of them would have not stayed in Jerusalem but returned to their homes thousands of kilometres away or across the countryside. But when people join us, we need to be prepared to adapt and change. We need to make sure that we're sensitive in the language that we use and the explanations we give around the things that we do and why we do it and in the introductions that we make. We continue to explore and grow in our understanding of what it means as for us as followers of Jesus as it changes our lives and as it changes our life as a church family together for the better. At the core of being a follower of Jesus is that it changes people's lives for the better. And yes, there are still changes that we, challenges that we face. There's going to be times of hurt and pain. Jesus doesn't promise us a free ride. Jesus doesn't promise us that those things will not affect us or impact us. But following Jesus and integrating what it means to be a follower of Jesus into our life should flavour every part of our life as we seek to live our lives well in Jesus. And following Jesus also places a call on our life to see the world around us differently. It should change the way we view the world. We should see it through Jesus' eyes as we care about others and we hear their heartbeat, as we seek to respond with God's love in relevant ways and pray for them to respond to the good news of Jesus too. Speaking of prayer, let me pray now. Jesus, as we reflect on and think about um, just the way that you are at work through the empowering of your Holy Spirit in the lives of not only those first followers, those, those believers um, in Acts chapter 2, but Holy Spirit, how you are at work in the lives of, of those that were hearing something strange, something weird that was going on that captured their attention, that raised questions. And yeah, there was some ridicule that took place. But Lord, there was an amazing response. Lord, I ask that you would continue to help us to see the call that you've placed on our lives 
as we seek to follow you, that we would respond in such a way that, that we would look around to those lives that we care about and that we would look at them with your eyes, with your heart and that we would look for opportunities to listen to what's going on for them and to respond and to help them to experience the good news of what it means to have you as Saviour and Lord. Amen. Today I want you to, I want to invite you to prayerfully consider the words in which God, uh, in sorry, today I want to prayerfully uh, ask you to prayerfully consider the world in which God has placed you, where he's placed you as a follower of Jesus. What are the names and the situations that come to mind? Who are those people? What are those contexts? It could be work, it could be home, it could be family, friends, neighbours, whatever it might be. Some music's going to be played and I invite you to prayerfully commit these people, these situations to Jesus and that the Holy Spirit would provide opportunities for you to show and to share the good news of Jesus with those that God has placed you in a context with. So I'm going to hand back to Alethea. Hopefully we'll do this transition okay where some music will be played and um, as a result of that, um, my encouragement is that you just take this time to, to pray and to spend with Jesus in a special way. Thanks, Alicia.